And okay, so Gautam, it is your screen and you may continue. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thank you to the organizers for um, you know inviting me to uh, speak on this. So uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about a well a classical effect in uh, classical you know uh, gravity and the implication for this effect in well in the space of asymptotic states in quantum gravity. So we'll see that we can actually learn a lot about the kind of kinematic structure of quantum gravity in asymptotically flat space times by really studying the classical theory, in particular, uh, the memory effect. So this is work uh, that I did with at UChicago um, with Bob Wald. Uh, some of the preliminary ideas that I'll be presenting uh, today can be found in this you know, paper that I've highlighted here, but much of the work I'll be talking about is significantly expanded beyond this uh, um, but they, beyond the uh, ideas that we presented in this paper. Okay, so just to give a kind of brief outline or, you know, uh, overview of the talk. So, I mean, the main punchlines are that, you know, the gravitational memory effect, which is a classical uh, effect, which uh, is a classical observable in asymptotically flat space times, uh, is responsible for all infrared divergences well in quantum gravity and the analogous effects in field theory are responsible for all of these so-called infrared divergences uh, in quantum field theory. So we'll see precisely how that occurs. And if we want to include the memory effect as like an asymptotic observable, then we really need to expand our Hilbert space of or our space of asymptotic states and the key question that I'll be addressing in this talk is, you know, how do we organize these space, the space of states together to form a Hilbert space to talk about scattering? So you could ask this question, well, in quantum field theory, as I'll be talking about, and you can also ask this question in quantum gravity. Okay, so just to get started, so just first in classical gravity, uh, the memory effect is the permanent relative separation of some array of test particles brought about by a burst of radiation. So if I allow some a burst of radiation to pass through your screen, then these test masses will oscillate and become permanently displaced at late times due to this passage of gravitational radiation. So this is an instance of the memory effect. And as I alluded to before, it's a property in asymptotically flat space time. So I won't go through, I don't uh, have a lot of time, so I won't go through the details of an asymptotically flat space time. And, and you know, it's customary to introduce these so-called Bondi coordinates in which the metric you know, has this asymptotic fall off to the Minkowski metric at order one over R. U is retarded time along scry, which is now a null surface in the compactified space time. And the angles uh, denote our coordinates on the cuts of scry, as I've noted here. Q is a metric on the sphere. Okay, uh, so the memory effect, as I alluded to, is a radiative phenomenon in particular. So the radiative data at scry can be uh, extracted by looking at the one over R part of the metric and projecting it into the sphere and removing its trace. So this is the so-called shear and the Bondi news tensor is the gauge invariant degrees of freedom of the uh, radiative data, which is the time derivative of the shear. So, the memory is expressed in terms of this radiative data as the integral of the news tensor over scry. So uh, in some you know, wide class of space times, in particular, I'll be considering space times in which the fall off of the news is sufficiently fast uh, uh, such that this memory converges. It's also interesting to consider uh, you know, weaker uh, conditions. Uh, then the memory can be written precisely in terms of the, di the difference of shears between early and late times. Okay, so why uh, do we call this the memory tensor? Well, this it precisely determines the change in the relative displacements of my test particles at scry between early and late time. So if the initial displacement of my test particles gets mapped to the change in the final displacement at leading order uh, by this memory tensor. So this is the quantity that we'll be really looking at for the rest of this talk. And uh, just the picture I want you to have is that any classical solution with memory at scry at low frequencies can be written as this kind of step function like behavior between early and late time. So that's the picture I want you to have for a classical solution with memory. Okay, and so finally, the last uh, you know thing that we're going to need is that via the Einstein equations, one can relate the memory uh, tensor to the kind of you know uh, data in the interior. So, in particular, the change in p, which is this mass aspect, uh, this it just 
uh, sometimes denoted as this p quantity in the memory literature, but this is just the mass aspect between early and late times, in particular for you know merging black holes or what have you. The change in p is determined by the incoming and outgoing momenta, and in particular for some massive body with some outgoing momentum, uh, it's simply given by this expression and is totally determined by this outgoing momentum. So gamma here is the usual kind of boost factor uh, that we get in these expressions. Uh, and so the punchline for the slide is that the memory is determined by the change in the angular distribution of the incoming and outgoing momenta. And uh, so this is known as the uh, kind of ordinary memory effect and the uh, total flux of gravitational radiation energy out to null infinity. So this is known as the null memory effect or the so-called Christodoulou memory effect. Okay. So now that we you know, have a sufficient understanding of the memory effect, uh, we can now see its implications for the, uh, in the quantum theory. So what do I mean by uh, quantum gravity? Well, the quantum gravity at Scry is perfectly well-defined even if the interior theory has not been defined. The idea is that one can construct the uh, kinematic space or the in and out states at Scry without making reference to any particular interior theory. And that's all I'll be doing in this talk is uh, discussing the uh, kinematic space. Uh, so Scry in particular is equipped with a natural norm by the symplectic product on Scry on these test tensors with fast fall off in retarded time, uh, which is just simply given by this kind of Klein-Gordon type norm on Scry. This is very similar to the kind of thing that you would do on initial data, but now this is at null infinity uh, and is given by this expression where S tilde is the Fourier transform of S. Okay, so given this norm, one can construct a one particle uh, Hilbert space and then a corresponding Fox space, uh, which contains a, uh, a, a vector, a vacuum state, which is invariant under the asymptotic symmetries, uh, in the, namely the BMS group, though that won't be so uh, necessary for this talk. Okay. So given this nice structure at Scry, the, now the question is, what does the state with memory look like? Well, from a classical solution, uh, we, we can construct a state with memory by taking a classical solution with memory, the sigma here, and just you know, peaking this vacuum state now at that classical solution. So constructing a coherent state now with memory. Uh, and this is a formal construction uh, because psi delta only defines an element of the usual Fox space if it has finite norm, if psi delta has finite norm. And when is that the case? Well, recall if the memory is non-vanishing, the shear uh, will diverge like one over the frequency and therefore psi delta will be logarithmically divergent at low frequency. So this is the origin of all infrared divergences well in quantum gravity and the analogous memory effects in quantum field theory give rise to the similar divergences. Okay, so what do we do? Well, the coherent states with memory are perfectly well-defined states, but they just live in a different Fox space, this F delta here. And if the memory is non-vanishing, F delta will be unitarily inequivalent to the usual uh, Fox space. Okay, so we need to include this F delta if we want to describe scattering, but the situation is much worse than that because memory is not a conserved quantity. The, you can scatter even classically between in and out states with different memories. Uh, and in full quantum gravity, we would need to include all of the F deltas for all uncountably many memories. And that's, this is the key issue that I'll be discussing for the rest of this talk. How do we do this in a way that is in a, to construct a Hilbert space that is, well, one separable, unitarily implements the asymptotic symmetry group, and finally is preserved under scattering. So if I start with an element of this Hilbert space, I end up with an element of this Hilbert space. Okay, so this is the key issue I'll be addressing for the rest of this talk. Uh, and let's just see now first a bad example. So one could consider for a, the direct sum over all of these uh, memory uh, Fox spaces. However, this space is absolutely gigantic. It's a non-separable Hilbert space because this is an uncountable direct sum over all possible memories. Okay, and furthermore, there's no guarantee that if I start with an element of the space, I end up with an element uh, that is also a direct in this direct sum Hilbert space. Okay, so 
Instead, it's much more sensible and we can construct a separable Hilbert space to consider a direct integral over all of these memory Fox spaces. So I don't have time to get into the construction of a direct integral. However, I'll just say that this constructs a separable Hilbert space with some choice of this infinite dimensional measure on the space of memories. And that's the key issue uh, for this construction is that you really need to uh, need a infinite dimensional measure on the space of memories. And the kind of punchline here is that there does not appear to be a satisfactory choice of measure. Uh, any two inequivalent choices of measures will give rise to inequivalent uh, Hilbert spaces. Uh, and you know what you also need is to guarantee that if you start with an element of this Hilbert space, you end up with a state that's out, you know, also in this Hilbert space. So we derive general constraints in, on any measure that, you know, is in this direct integral representation and uh, implements the asymptotic symmetry group. But, you know, as uh, just an example, we investigate this in the case of Gaussian measures, and we show that there exists no Gaussian measure which unitarily implements. Well, in this case, well, I just wrote the Poincaré group because I didn't want to introduce the BMS group, but in particular, the BMS group but uh, the issues arise even in the Poincaré generators. Okay, the problem uh, and what I'll be kind of addressing for the rest of this talk is the space of memories is just too big. There, one, there does not appear to be a nice you know, choice of measure that uh, puts these together. And really the uh, problem here is that the space of memories is just far too big. So in QED, there is an analogous problem. So you could ask this question in QED and there's an analogous problem of infrared divergences, which arise from the electromagnetic memory effect. In that case, there is a well-defined prescription for reducing the space of memories by uniquely correlating the memory of the electron, a memory of the state to the electron state. So that's known as the so-called Fedeyev and Coolidge dressing. And for the next couple of minutes, I'll just explain uh, what precisely that uh, what that is, and we'll see if we can do this in uh, quantum gravity. Okay, so the main idea is that the memory depends on the low frequency part of the field, and in this regime, the electrons are effectively classical. So we're going to only include only those memories that correspond to the memory of a classical charged particle. So the memory of a classical charged particle with some outgoing momentum is given by a similar expression as before. Note that there's no null memory uh, term uh, and delta now is now a one form on the sphere as opposed to a two tensor. Okay, the Fidei of Coolidge dressing is to simply correlate the plane wave state of the electron to an electromagnetic memory state, but not any memory state, the memory determined by this classical relation. And then a full dressed one electron state is a wave packet made up of the composite field integrated over the momentum hyperboloid. So this now memory does not span a infinite dimensional space in this one electron state, it spans a finite dimensional space. And that's the key point here. So you can also do the same thing for N electrons where now the memory uh, uh, is determined by the memory of N outgoing charged particles. And now the key point is that the memory is uniquely determined by the classical relations and spans a finite dimensional space in any of these you know, n particle sectors. Okay, it's highly plausible that a state that is prepared with these correlations will evolve to an out state with these correlations. This has been the subject of rigorous investigation uh, well in the non-relativistic setting as well as in perturbation theory where uh, it has been, you know, there are many, uh, there's been a, a lot of evidence to show that these kinds of correlations uh, will persist uh, between uh, when uh, under scattering. So now the question is, can we hope that such a thing can be true in gravity? Well, the corresponding relation uh, for an outgoing body is given by this expression where now we have a null memory effect and that's going to be the key problem uh, in this slide. Okay, so I'll just remind you, the Fidei of Coolidge dressing relied on the ability to independently specify the electromagnetic memory state and the electron state in order to construct a space of composite states with the classical correlations. There is no analog of this procedure in general relativity. One cannot independently specify the source of the memory uh, with the memory uh, state. There, I mean, the, the key point here is that gravity in contrast to QED, uh, acts as its own source of memory, and therefore one cannot form the sub-Hilbert space and the Fideev and Coolidge construction fails. 
Uh, in you know, summary, the memory is now just an arbitrary tensor on the sphere. It spans an infinite dimensional space and one cannot reduce it to a finite dimensional subspace. Okay, so let me just summarize. So uh, there exists many unitarily inequivalent representations of the Hilbert space at null infinity and any the you know, usual procedure for reducing the space of memories to thereby yield a, a, a unique uh, Hilbert space construction uh, fails in quantum gravity. So what do we do? Well, the situation in quantum gravity is analogous to the situation for quantum fields uh, in curved spacetime, where there exist many unitarily inequivalent uh, Hilbert sp uh, space representations, none of which are preferred. It appears that the much more natural description of scattering uh, is in the algebraic framework, where the in and out algebraic states do not require a preferred Hilbert space. So to you know, really uh, make this statement more precise, this necessitates, well, one, a precise construction of the algebra of asymptotic observables, not just at null infinity, but also at spatial infinity and understanding these matching conditions much better. And as well as an S matrix formulation now on algebraic states, as opposed to uh, a formulation on in and out Hilbert spaces. Okay, so with that, I will end my talk. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I just... Let me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, question oh, on chat, there are some remarks. Oh, there, there are only that something is okay, but. Ah. Peter, the question uh, from uh, Peter Eichelberg. Yes, Peter, go yes, ahead. Yes, please. Uh, uh, I have a naive question. I understand yeah. that the uh, uh, Christodoulou uh, uh, effect is uh, due to, it's also called nonlinear memory effect. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, is, is that the reason why in electrodynamics there's no, uh, no, no, this uh, term at Skry? Uh, yes, um, I mean, you could also ask this question in Yang Mills theory, uh, but uh, where the, the theory is actually, I mean, truly nonlinear, uh, and you also don't get a nonlinear effect. So it's not true that, you know, I, I mean, it is true that every linear theory will not give a nonlinear effect, but it's not true that all nonlinear theories will give a nonlinear effect. Uh, but, but isn't this uh, the, the integral over the, the, the bond in use? In gravity? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So, so it's the yeah. energy radiated through, through sky essentially. Mm -hmm. So, what uh, there's an analog effect in electromagnetism where energy goes through sky. That's right. So, that's correct. You, so, you can get a null memory. So, I was talking in QED where I'm considering massive mm -hmm. matter. Uh, but if you considered massless matter, then you would get an expression for the null memory effect, it won't be nonlinear in, I mean, it would be nonlinear. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it would be the flux of the current uh, of the null current to scry. Uh, it, it's a, a, a you know, very similar expression to the one given here. Uh, but the corresponding Fedeyev and Coolish kind of dressing would be allowed in that context because the uh, current is, you know, it, you can, you can, um, you can, uh, I mean, the, the current, you know, if you're given a particular current that can be used to uniquely determine the memory. In this context, you given a particular state of the gravitational field, you are specifying both the memory and the uh, flux of radiation. So there, I mean, the problem is that the, 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 uh, the gravitational field determines the left-hand side and the right-hand side separately. Whereas in most, I mean, in, in uh, massless QED, uh, the current only determines, you know, this uh, this null memory term. Thank you. Jacek, if you look at the list of participants, there are two questions from panelists and one from the attendees. So if you just open the panel, the participants list, you can just decide mm -hmm. whom you're giving the. But how how can I do it? I see okay, well... from my Nakivi. I've already enabled him to... You click on participants. And what? Okay, good. So let me just... Uh, so so yeah, there's no, Igor no, Kapkin who wants I, I, to ask a question, for example. Yes. Uh, so um, if uh, I understand correctly, the, the connection between the, um, the memory sectors uh, mm -hmm. 
of incoming and outgoing uh, radiation uh, is is already a question at the classical level. Right. So I mean, if you're giving the the sector of the um, of the of the memory for the incoming radiation, right. it's it, in principle once you have all the the initial data, you can ask the question: What is this the memory sector of the outgoing data? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if someone were to solve the classical problem for you, could you use this as input to you know um, fix some of these non-uniqueness issues in the, or the the of, of fixing the the uh, sectors in, in quantum scattering? Uh, no. So so uh, uh, so even at the classical level, if you give me the memory of the incoming uh, state in non-linear gravity, there is. I mean, it, so this is not. You know, linearized or perturbative in any sense that there is no way to determine a priori what the out state memory is. I mean, I'll, I'll just give you the so, uh, you know, if you give me the memory of the incoming state, the there is this if you and you assume the kind of matching conditions uh, at spatial infinity so that you know, uh, effectively, um, the yeah, let me try to yeah, so the memory, this is in QED, but uh, effectively, so it, the memory is given by the difference of charges in general, plus the null memory term. So you, know, you shouldn't take this expression too literally, because I wrote this one for QED, but you can consider the, uh, the analogous expression in, in gravity. We don't see your screen, Gautam. So uh, I think you, you oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm not exactly sure. Am I, did I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, you okay. did. Uh, well, anyway, I, I won't, uh, I'll just speak and, you know, we, we can chat offline if we need to as well. So uh, there is this matching problem at spatial infinity. So let's assume we have the matching problem uh, and, you know, you can match the charges from coming from scribe minus to scribe plus. Even in that case, uh, the nonlinear uh, or the null memory effect implies that the, you know, only the total uh, memory plus null memory uh, is conserved between scribe minus and scribe plus. So if you tell me the memory of the incoming state that doesn't uniquely determine the memory of the outgoing state, I also need the null memory or the total flux of the radiation. Uh, so that, that, that's actually the key problem here. So if you could tell me the, in, you know, the memory of the outgoing state uniquely, then I, there is, I mean, you scatter just to one of these memory states, but as I mentioned, the memory is just not a conserved quantity. Uh, in classical gravity, so there there is no way to, to do sure, that. but that's why I was referring to yeah. uh, like sectors or or classes. So I mean, this is a wishful thinking, but one can imagine the result that's saying that say you're in asymptotically flat space and you uh, uh, you restrict yourself to initial data at some finite time, certain uh, you know asymptotic decay and a certain um, class of of uh, incoming memory right mm -hmm. so as you say one uh one can ask the question well one doesn't know a priori what is going to be the outgoing memory mm -hmm. but you can you know ask the question whether you can determine classes which are stable under evolution yeah, so I, I would say such a thing doesn't immediately follow uh, from the, so that would be some extra input for sure uh, on the class of an, so if it does, like, for example, you could consider Christodoulou Kleinerman kind of initial data, and in that case, there is no, there doesn't appear to be, you know, uh, well, in that case, they, sorry, for that particular case, the memory is finite. If you do, it, it, sorry, zero, the, but if you weaken the Christodoulou Kleinerman, initial data slightly so that you get non-vanishing uh, memory effects, uh, then um, it doesn't, I don't think there is there. I think the memory is truly an arbitrary tensor on the sphere. I don't think you can, uh, you, it's, it's limited within a class of the kind that you uh, uh, mentioned, but I would have to go and I would have to really check. Well, that. This I mean, just an interesting open problem. It's, 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 it's wish, wishful <laughs> thinking for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There is another question from the audience. Yatsik, should we uh, be a Syed? Uh, hi, yes. am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, so you had shown this like memory fox state. So I wanted to ask like all these different kind of memories, say displacement, velocity, or spin memory effect, all these would be sort of defined by like one general memory fox state, or you would have like, like different memory fox states for different memories? Um, yeah, so the, 
the question is basically, yeah. So if you have different of uh, these sub leading memory effects, uh, mm -hmm. um, do you get uh, you know unitarily an equivalent Hilbert spaces in that context? So so I, I believe the answer is so I haven't investigated this myself, but the I believe the answer is that you these do not yield unitarily an equivalent Hilbert spaces in the norm that I described. So uh, in the quantization that I gave, uh, I believe that just the memory effect alone yields these unitarily an equivalent Hilbert spaces. So the uh, those states with spin memory or you know other kinds of memory uh, would be you know contained within this. Uh, well, sorry, I shouldn't say spin memory. I, maybe displacement memory or the you know the the sub leading things uh, will be contained in this um, in these memory fox spaces. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. I I would also have a question. So uh, one uh, knows that there are concerns about the smoothness of scry. So in all these calculations, you're assuming the scry is smooth and uh, is it the case? And if there were logarithmic terms, would they destroy this or, or just uh, be irrelevant for this kind of considerations? Right, so I, I believe it, it is just assumed that the, uh, you know, the Bondi news tensor and the mass is defined so that you can, you know, use the leading order kind of Einstein's equation. So if you have logarithmic uh, you know, terms or polyhomogeneous terms at subleading, you know, you know, at lower orders in um, the expansion, uh, those shouldn't affect uh, these relations, I think. Uh, but I, I'm not, I, I, off the top of my head, though, that would be my answer to that. Thanks. Okay. So I think we can slowly finish for today but if somebody wants to discuss longer just informally you are welcome so maybe i will have some remarks to peter about this cry i can we can discuss privately if you like uh, 